to give you a sneak preview of the experience you're going to be having on Friday and on Saturday. If my curriculum would allow me, this would have been pre-flames, flames, and then post-flames. Um, but because we don't have all the time in the world, if I give you everything today, I don't know what you're gonna, I'm going to give you on Friday. So, but I want to bring to your attention, and I think the reason why I, I want to have this conversation is because of the state of the church, not just the Brook Place, but the church is the universal mystical church. I think we, we've lost the, the blueprints of the church. And that's the reason why a church that do not have the apostolic model is an organization, not an organism. And as you spend the time to look at the book of Revelation, it is the apocalypse of the Christos of Christ. But it's interesting as you look at chapter number 1, verse 19, the book of Revelation gives us the outline of the book. The Bible says, the Lord said to John, write the things which you have seen, which is the resurrected Jesus in chapter number 1. The things which are at the time that John was writing the book of Revelation. And a lot of theologians believe that the book of Revelation was written between AD 95 and AD 96. Um, it was a time when Domitian, who was the emperor at the time, had sent John on exile. And that was about 95, 96 AD. And John did not come back. Now, Domitian was the brother to Titus. So realize that when John was writing the thing that he saw at the time was the seven churches and the things which would shortly take place after the seven churches, which is the Greek is the word metatauta, which means after these. But it's interesting that the book of Acts documented 30 years of the church's history. You cannot get the full grasp of the ecclesia just reading the book of Acts because it only covers 40 years. But the book of Revelation chapter number two and three has documented over 2,000 years and still counting. But there are a lot of reasons why Paul would choose, sorry, John would choose these seven churches. There were profound churches in, the, in, the, in, 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 in that region. There, were, there was the church of, you know, Colossae, Philippi. We had the church of Rome. Uh, Jerusalem was there. But it's interesting how the Lord would choose these seven churches in Asia Minor, present day Turkey. But as you look at the seven churches, one of the things I needed to realize is that, that these were letters written to seven churches, literal, physical churches. They have commendation and condemnations. Actually, the only one that have no condemnation is actually Philadelphia and, and Smyrna. But I want you to follow me to so can understand the context of the church. These seven churches, we are literal churches. Well, look at the transmission of the, of the letter. The Bible says the revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus, whom the Father gave to Jesus. Jesus gave to an angel. An angel gave to John. John gave to the seven leaders of the churches. The seven leaders gave to their members. The father, to the son, the son, to an angel, an angel, to John, from John, to the seven leaders, the seven angels of the seven churches, the, the leaders, and from them to the churches. You, you realize the six transitions or transmission of the word of the Lord. But it's interesting how the Bible says, write the things which are. And we understand, if you look at the timeline of the churches, you cannot understand revelation without revelation. I have struggled to do a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. I've had a lot of people say to my pastor, would you do a verse-by-verse -verse commentary? And I asked them, which would you prefer, Hebrews and Revelation? These are two books that you cannot understand. First and foremost, you cannot understand Hebrews without Hebrew. It's a language. You cannot understand the book of Hebrews because it was written to a Jewish believer. So that syntax... And the lexicons and the grammar has to be, the context has to be Judaic. Are you following me? And you cannot understand revelation without revelation. Hence, you have different types of um, exegesis. There are those who are called the historicists, the idealists, the futurists, and the preterists. And um, because I'm a futurist, uh, I'm going to give you the book of Revelation because the Bible says, the Lord said to John, right, this is the book, this book of prophecy. It's a book of prophecy. What preterism is that the things happened in the first century A.D., but the Bible calls the book of Revelation a prophecy. Amen. So at the time that John was writing the book, it has to be futuristic. Amen, church. Amen. Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Seven churches in the time of John that can profile the current church. Ephesus was the first church. And this was the church that we call the apostolic church. Ephesus was between 6 BC and 100 AD. 
So my says 70 AD, but it went past the time of the temple. The church of Ephesus was the apostolic church. This was the church that was founded by the early apostles, not the patriarchs serving the early apostles, not the patristic leaders, not Arenas, not Tertullian, not Origen. I mean, the early apostles of Jesus. They founded the church and the church was born in Acts chapter number two. On the day of Pentecost, the church was not in the Old Testament. The word assembly in the Old Testament was called kahal, which means a congregation, not the ecclesia. The ecclesia was born Acts chapter number, chapter number two on the day of Pentecost. That was the same day that the law was given to the Jews. So you find that the apostolic church was between 6 BC to 70 AD or more. We, we use 100 AD to be careful with the timing. This was the church that had what you call everything. They, they, they were a church that they understood the ministry of Jesus. They were eyewitnesses of the ministry of Jesus. They, these were churches established by the apostles who followed Jesus. So everything that the apostles did in 70 AD and above, we are thinking that they saw firsthand from Jesus. It was apostolic because it had the blueprint of God. And once you understand that the reason why they called the apostolic church was because the tenet of faith or the canon of truth was within apostolicity, within the, 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 the revelation of the apostles. They understood what the church was. They understood the church was an organism, not just an organization, not just a building, but a people. And as you spend the time, you realize that the apostolic church had a blueprint. That's what the Bible says in Acts chapter number 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' didactic doctrines. Are you following me, church? The apostolic church was the church that had the template on the revelation of Christ. Who the men say that I am in Matthew 16. And on this revelation, I will build an ecclesia. And the gate of Hades. Hades is not a grave. The gate of Hades, the Greek word for Sheol shall not you can't withstand the church but hold on so you realize that the apostolic church was a mobilizing army and that's the reason why i tell every time i am sick of this 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 not even synonym not even comparison of the church being a hospital the apostolic church was never a hospital it was mobilizing men to attack hell to realize the apostolic church was a church called to war not to be bandaged with plasters and your leg hung on on on, on a bed we are soldiers, not patients. Are you hearing, church? We are an apostolic army. Bible says, and the gate of Hades shall not prevail. It is the church that does the offensive. So it's not a church that, that stays back, and, and, and that's where the church hasn't matured into our prophetic assignment. And if I tell you where the church is, the Bible says, until we come to the fullness of the knowledge of the anthropos of Christ, until we come to the revelation of Christ, I believe the church is still in the manger. We haven't matured yet. If the church had matured, there were things you wouldn't expect in the body of Christ. Because the church is meant to be a place where we come together and we colonize. The apostolic mandate was to establish the kingdom of God. The church is not a kingdom. They are the carriers of the kingdom. Basilia, from the word base. The church is the entity the organism that carries the kingdom of God and establish the kingdom of God on the earth. The purpose of the church is to build colonies on the earth. And so that they set men free, they are citizens in other nations and give them legislative rights in that, in, that, in that space. So the apostolic church was about hell. The apostolic church was missional. Are you hearing church? An amazing church. So you find that between 6 BC and 70 AD, I believe, it was the apostolic. Everything they did was apostolic. The church is wonky. And as you spend the time to understand apostolic succession, you would realize that one of the reasons why the church is where she is at the moment is because we have, we have literally, we have turned the template. Who were the successors of the apostles? The bishops. The bishops, episcopos, those were the ones who took care of the church. The apostles ordained bishops. Are you hearing me, church? May I preach the word of the Lord? The apostles called, the word bishop for the word episcopos, split into presbyterians and episcopal, means overseers. Bishops are called oikonomos, administrators. Are you hearing? The apostles were missional, and they put bishop to take care of the flocks. They were the steward of the local house. What the apostles were those who went out to colonize. Are you hearing church? And we wonder why the church is wanting because those that are meant to ordain have been ordained by those that are meant to ordain. Yes. Wow. Are you hearing church? The apostolic church was God. God never, God never called bishops. He said he who desires 
the office of a bishop, but the fivefold is called. This is God's governmental. It's called oikonomos. God's governmental administrators on the earth. The apostolic church was a church of order. The apostles were not those who are known to have sons and daughters. The apostle is from the Greek word apostolos. But apostolos is nothing without an apostolo. An apostolo is a document that the apostolos carries. Oh, God help me today. The apostolos is a person. The apostolo is a mandate. You are a prophet. What is your mandate? You are an apostle. That's not enough. What is your assignment? Because what happened back in the day, the apostle would take the letter from his king, but the king would put a molten wax and a signet ring. So what the apostle does, it protects that wax. If the wax breaks, then the letter becomes null and void. You hear me, church? Are you hearing? So much so that when the other king receives the letter that is bound and sealed, he honors the carrier of the letter. Why? Because the carrier of the letter stands in the administration of his king. Apostles were honored and venerated. Why? Because they were not emissaries. They were men deployed. They were men deployed to mess up the agenda of another nation. Apostolic church was a church known to war, not wine. Are you hearing me, church? That everyone understands your assignment. I'm not a baby in this thing. I know how. I'm a soldier. Do you understand? So you're a soldier. I'm a man. I'm gripped for war. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Put on the old armor of God, no bandages. Apostolic church are militant people. We talk militancy. We preach militancy. We love militantly. Apostolic church. Apostolic church, we don't have... Listen, there's no medic in that space. Everyone has a rifle. Our summit is to point and kill. Are you hearing me, church? You can't be having soft softies as apostles. And you can't have an apostolic that have softies. We war. It is in our DNA. We war. So you realize that the early church was very apostolic. And then these men had the, they had the mandate of the church. They understood what the church was. Now, from 70 AD to 313 AD was the church of Smyrna. The word Smyrna from the word myrrh. We have the word my. It's an oil that gets from crushing. When Jesus was born, they brought gifts. Gold, frankincense, and my, right? Gold represents his kinghood. Frankincense represents his priesthood. And myrrh represents the prophet. The prophet is designed to be crushed. <laughs> a prophetic church is a crushing church. What makes a prophetic church a prophetic church is that they bring oil from crushing. Are you hearing me, church? You are a prophetic church. Be ready for the attacks that will come. The assignment of a prophetic church is to bring that fragrance in crushing. Are you, do you understand that? Jesus has come as a priest and, a, and, and, a, and as a prophet, but he's going to come back as a king. And we understand that the early church, that's the church of Smyrna, it was called the persecuted church. You, you, you're part of, a, of an apostolic prophetic house and you're afraid of persecution. Come on, welcome it. You cannot avoid it in a prophetic house. Because the devil, the devil will not fight the house that carry glory. You're going through attack because you're in the right place. The devil will not, uh, will not inflict a man that, has, that is not a threat to him. Why would he have your problem? If you don't have his time, you will have your time. It is a man that's a threat to hell. That he wants to mess with it. So the church of Smyrna was called the persecuted church. But this church was also called the Catholic church. Not the Roman Catholic. The Catholic church, the word Catholic means oneness. It means universal. It was a church that had one faith, one hope, one baptism, Ephesians chapter number four. And that's the reason why when you study the book of Ephesians, chapter number one to three, speaks of the believer's blessings in the heavenly places. Chapter four to six speaks of the believer's walk on the earth. So like I say every time, chapter one, the calling of the church. Chapter two, the commissioning of the church. Chapter three, the constitution. Chapter four, the conduct of the church. Chapter five, the confession. And chapter six, the conflict. In chapter number four, the Bible says, I beseech you to walk worthy, axios, peripatio, walk worthy according to the clarity's call with which you've been called. You walk in chapter four to six. You sit in chapter one to three. So chapter number four of Ephesians speaks about the walk of the church. But in, in Revelation chapter number two, we find the church of Smyrna being crushed. That was the Catholic church. They had one faith, one hope, one everything. They were one, united in one, but they were being crushed. But the more they crushed them and they spread abroad, the more they evangelized to the nations of the world. So persecution is one way to evangelize. Are you hearing me, church? 
when you go through persecution, God wants you to evangelize his grace in that space. The next church was called Pergamos. That was from 313 to 590 AD. Pergamos, the word gamos in the Greek is the word marriage. It was when the church got married to the state. The time of Constantine. The Constantinopolitan church. Where the church is now mixed with the world. That was the time called the time of Pergamos. An interesting time in church history. This was a time where all the prophets had been silenced. Why? They brought in a concept called clericalism. And they ended con con congregationalism. Clericalism is when the Pope becomes the head of the church. And because he's the head of the church, every prophet and apostle has to be silenced, killed. Because there is no way they would speak and a Pope would speak. That was a time a system called papacy or popery was, in, was, was initiated. Where popery becomes the, the, the Pope becomes the head of the church. And as the head, no prophet can speak. It terminated all the prophets that they could see in that Roman world. The time of Pergamos. Because of that time of excommunication, they went into 598 to 1517 called the time of the Dark Age. In the Dark Age, there was no Christianity. All the Christians ran and they changed religion. Some went to, some became monks. Because they were afraid of the Catholic, the Roman Catholic system that would exterminate them. A dark age. A age that evil became good. A age where things that belong to God was given to Satan. A dark age. After the Roman Catholic Church was called the Middle Age, the medieval church. So dark that it looks like the church was not in existence. All the prophets silenced. All the apostles silenced. It was during that period of the of Papri and, and the Middle Age that we lost the apostolic mandate. The church became highly Roman Catholicized. But in the midst of that dark age, from 1517 to 1648, came a man by the name of Martin Luther, who was a reformer. And he fought against the Catholic system, but he did an unfinished business. Because all Martin Luther did was to correct the, the, the concept of salvation, soteriology. But did not bring back the fivefold that was in scripture. So even though reformation was celebrated from, you know, from 1517 to 1648, the truth is that the reformation did not finish what it started. The reformation church. Tyre, Tyra. That woman who calls herself a prophetess. Who calls herself. Because all the prophetic voices had been silenced and the woman rose up. I said, I am the prophetess. Tyre, Tyre. The word Tyre, Tyre means daughter. And you track Tyre, Tyre back to a man by the name of Nimrod who got married to a woman called Semiramis. And they had a child called Tammuz. And from there, the name turned from Semiramis to Pelopia. From Pelopia to Huhufia. From Huhufia to Tyre, Tyre. Where they brought in a... Whenever you find a woman in the Bible, it means a religious system. Where a religious system was brought in Spend the time to read books. Or we, we, we talk about the, the beast. But we don't talk about the woman who rides the beast. Uh, I wish I had the time today. We, we talk about the antichrist, the, the beast. But how about the woman? Someone rode the beast. Someone controlled the beast. Spend the time and look at the woman who rode on the beast. You understand Tyre Tyra. And why the church is on constant attack. And she's adorned in purple. You know the... Oh, let's leave that from that day. You know what purple means. After Tyatera came the next one called Philadelphia. A missionary church in the midst of this darkness. The word Philadelphia from the word Phileo. What you call Philio, kind of love. You have Agape, Eros, Philio. Philadelphia, friendly church. But the problem with this church, it became too friendly. It lost its apostolic mandate. It became too pastoral. This is where the pastors began to pet sin. Oh, we're not against you. Uh, God can give you grace to overcome. The apostles back in Bible time, they slayed. They cut the head of the python, not pet it. The church of Philadelphia was missional, extremely missional. They brought back the kingdom of God. But guess what? They lost its apostolic nature of warfare. They became friendly. Apostles are not friendly. We war. Are you hearing me, church? We war. And finally, the last church. That was from 1789 to the present age. is called the Laodicea. Laodicea. The church that made God sick. How can God, the divine, you, was, you say you're neither cold or hot. 
Make up your mind. Yes, I'll throw you. The KJV say, I will vomit you. This is the age of the church that made God sick. Where God will go to NHS. Because the church made him sick to his stomach. And the reason why the church made him sick, the Bible says you are neither hot or I pray, he said, Jesus said, I pray you are hot or cold so I can make up my mind. I need to know how to judge you. And I want to talk about that flame, that hot believer. The one who was like the early apostolic church. The one who don't allow gossip and murmur and the things of the world to shake them. It comes to a space in your Christian faith. You don't allow things to shake you. You are to soldiers. Do you know who you are? You allow petty things to shake you. I'm so I listen, my assignment is to wage war against hell, not my brother. Soldier. Taking the church back to back to militancy and not murmuring and mickery. Militancy. You speak as a soldier. You know, you know, you know, once you know how you are built, you know how to respond. I'm a some say I'm a soldier. It's a song back there that says, I'm a soldier of the cross. If you have your Bibles quickly, the book of I mean over the time today. All right. Second Timothy chapter number one, verse number six. Let's read together. The Bible says, Therefore, now you don't start the sentence with therefore. If you look at the previous verses, you will see that Paul was writing that this is a pastoral epistle. You hear me loud and clear. Because the context will be different in the moment. Paul wrote three types of books. The general epistle, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, that's the normal Pauline books. Then Paul wrote what he called the prison epistle, Ephesians. Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. And Paul wrote what he called the pastoral epistle. This is for the pastor, Titus and Timothy. So it's very pastoral. It's speaking to a man who, who was going to become the bishop of the church of Ephesus, the apostolic church. Follow me slowly, church. He was writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, who will become the bishop of the church of Ephesus. If you take the time and have got to study the book of Ephesus, you realize that Ephesus had everything amazing but one thing. They have left their first love. I think the epidemic or the problem with apostolic churches is not doctrine. We have it. It's not prayers. We have it. It's not casting demons. We have it. What we don't have is love. That was the same issue with Ephesus. But this one I have against you, that you have left it. Thank God you haven't lost it. You only left it. But if you leave it, you can come back. Are you hearing me, church? So Paul was writing to his precious son, Timothy, and saying to his precious son, admonishing him for his salvation through his grandmother and his mother. And because Paul had established the fact that this young man is saved, he says, therefore, I remind you, hold on, if Paul is saying that it reminds Timothy, then we have to go back to where he reminded him. Say to you, never be reminded. It's bringing it upon his son again. Why? Because there were people back in the day, the syncretists and the Gnostics and the atheists that had come to the church of Ephesus and we are bringing another type of doctrine intimidating Timothy. They were the laurels and they were these high Greek scholars, the philosophers, are coming to the church and teaching all the types of doctrines. And this young man by the name of Timothy was intimidated by these great scholars. And then fed up with the church and saying to his father, I need to quit because these this guys are more than me. Then Paul writes to remind him, Therefore I remind you to stay up. Now because we are talking about the reminder or reminding him of stirring up, let's go back to the scripture where he reminded him the first time. First Timothy chapter number 4, verse 14, I believe. First Timothy 4, 14. The Bible says, this was Paul. What we read before was the second Timothy. That's why he says, I remind you. So now back to the reminder, first Timothy. Are you following me, church? Yes, sir. Bible says, do not neglect the gift. Somebody say gift. 
Do not neglect the gift that is in you. Are you hearing me, church? Which was given to you by prophecy. So there was a dimension of prophecy that can make impartation. Ah, epithesis. That's a dimension of prophecy. Prophecy cannot make you a prophet. Prophecy cannot affirm you in an office. It gives you the ability to prophesy. Are you hearing? The Bible says, which was given to you, that word, given, a lot of times I've told you before, when you find the word give or given, it means that the source, ah, oh God help me here today, and it's not Bible college, that's what you call subjective genitive. Subjective genitive deals with the source. Objective genesis deals, genitive deals with the means. Are you hearing church? Yes. So subjective genitive, genitive means that prophecy Bible says given to you. By. So the means of this gift is by prophecy. Are you hearing church? Don't underestimate prophecy. Prophecy was not designed to just give you your phone numbers and your house address. The purpose we see in scripture was to instill spiritual gifts. Are you hearing church? Are you hearing church? Yes, the Bible says, with the laying on of the hands of the presbyteros. The presbytery. So what Paul was saying to Timothy, that when the elders laid hands on you, they imparted you with a gift. Are you hearing me, church? Now let's go back again to the book of First, Second Timothy chapter number 1, verse 6. Now we know that Paul said it in this verse, First Timothy. Let's go to Second Timothy 1, one verses that we just read before. Therefore, why is Paul writing therefore why he already told him that he was, it has been imparted. Because the distance between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy was the invitation of the Gnostics. And now this young man is discouraged. And sometimes, you know, you just have to encourage yourself in the Lord. When no one is encouraging you. Just have to say, you know, God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for sunshine. <laughs> Therefore, I remind you to stay up. Somebody says, stay up. I remind you to stay up the gift. I like this word, the gift of God. I thank God for First Timothy, Second Timothy chapter number one, verse because it's a gift of God. It is not a physical talent. It's God's property. The first you realize that 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 you have is God's property. But the word stay up is the word anosopurio. The word I know so poor, I'm going to explain the word. The word I know, zoom, and par. I know means in the midst of. Zoom is a creature and pipe, fire. Some translator will tell you to find the flame. It is a gift of God, but the gift of God is only activated by fanning. That is the same word I said every time when the Spirit of God came, because the gift of God, upon the apostles in the upper room. Bible says, and it came on them. It didn't come in them. It came on them first. And then in them. Hold on the word. Bible says, but you shall receive power. The word receive is the word you shall obtain. That obtaining is not God's responsibility. The spirit comes on you, but power doesn't come until you obtain it. So there were many spirit-filled believers without power. Because power is the responsibility of the recipient. That was the word lambano, to obtain. So the spirit has come upon me, but I have to obtain power from the spirit. Are you here in church? It's like this guy saying, I, there is a gift of God, but you have to stir it. God will not come and stir the fire for you. Are you hearing me, church? You are so powerful, but you haven't activated. Are you hearing me, church? You are so powerful. All that is needed is activation. Stir. Somebody says stir. Find the flame. 
Found the flame, the Bible says. Stay up. So I'm telling you the word stay means to rekindle. So there's a reason why Paul would say to Timothy to stay. Why? Because at some point in his ministry, he had been intimidated by these Gnostics and lost his fire. And every now and again, you and I go through seasons in our lives that we could possibly lose our fire. We used to pray five hours back in the day, and now we pray 60 seconds and we yawn. Back in the day, we prayed and prayed and never looked at the time. Now every five minutes, we look at the clock. There was a fire in our bones, staring in our inside. That when we prayed, we stayed on our knees and prayed till it's dawn. But nowadays, you pray and you yawn and you're hungry. There was something that has happened in the process. Set your neighbor, stay the fire. That was something, you know, back in the day when he first got saved, that inner hunger. My goodness, back in the day, I remember when I first got saved. I would stay on my knees and weep and wake up and, and I've been here for 12 hours. What had happened to the fire? So for some reason, Timothy, who was a spiritual son, who understood the things of the spirit because of the pressure from outside and because he was a young man for some reason, all these guys had come into the church and told him to shut up. What do you know as a young man? We are great philosophers. And this man who thought he was anointed for some reason began to lose focus on his assignment. And the church that was growing in numbers began to decline. And all the men in church that spoke in tongues began to decline uh, and everyone who walked in miracles in church began to decline uh, and all of a sudden the news got to Paul uh, and Paul said to Timothy my son I thought you were amazing uh, would you please stop up the fire that it was in you when I first met you there was something going on in the church the church was dwindling because the one who had the fire was sleeping so we said stir up we said find the flame Find the flame. But the Bible says, stir up, bring by the scripture, stir up the gift of God. And I like this part. It is not your gift. It is God's gift. But it is your responsibility to stay. Let me make you understand. God loaned you this thing. It is not your property. So be very careful how you deal with God's property. It is not your gift. It is the gift of God. And I don't understand how the church has gone to a place where we commodify these giftings. I've seen prophets and apostles tell you before they see you, you have to pay certain amounts. It's interesting how the church has been commodifying this gift for years. That this is not your property. This is the property of God. And I understand the quality of your of your service is based on how you treat the gift. It's the gift of God. And if it is God's gift, it's a secret gift. It is a secret thing. So the use has to be secret. You don't use the gift to play lottery. I was in, I was in Las Vegas. <laughs> and everywhere in Las Vegas you find... Yeah, you know what you know. You see, what's, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Everywhere you go in Vegas, you see this rolling thing. Is it rolling? What do you call it? And I don't know this Satan from my father's house. <laughs> say to me, you know you, are, you know you are gifted. I say, yes. <laughs> say to me, you know you need a church building. I say, yes. <laughs> say, all you need to do is just call. You know the numbers already. I was the father. <laughs> See, but, but, but the gift of God is sacred, so the use has to be, somebody says sacred. sacred. Which is in you through the laying on of man. So it's interesting how, now there might be two cases or one case. It might be that Paul joined the elders to lay hands on Timothy. Or it could be that on another occasion, Paul laid hands on Timothy. So we saw that the elders laid hands and Paul laid hands for the same gift. It's interesting that that word, the gift, is the word charis. Somebody say charis. Now, that's what carries is the gift of the Spirit. Are you following me, church? So the gift of God, there's the gift of the Spirit. It's a pneuma. I, I told the church it's not pneuma. It's called pneuma. The P is silent, but it's called pneuma gift. We call it pneumatology. It's pneumatology. Anyway, clap for me. Good. Yeah. Oh, pneumatology. It's not pneuma. It's called pneuma. Pneuma. It comes with a wind. It has to come out like pneuma. Anyway. This was the same gift found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Are you following me, church? This is the part that will blow your mind because I'm going to read the more scripture I'll let you go today. This gift that you call pneumatological gift is not for you. It is through you. Paul was writing to his son. He's the pastor of the church. And Paul is saying to stir the gift that the church needs. This is not a gift that belongs to him. 
is a gift that he passes through the church. Are you hearing me? So the purpose of the staring is not for Timothy. The purpose of the staring is for the church. There were gifted people here, cast this, it will blow your mind. There were gifted people here sitting on empty chairs. Your gift is not for you. What is in you is for others. What is on you is for you. Let me say it again. What is in you is for others. What is on you is for you. Are you hearing me, church? So Paul says to Timothy, rekindle the gift of God. There was a fire in your belly. These guys are just philosophers. There was something that they don't know. You've got fire in your bones. They might preach all kinds of philosophies. Pythagoras, Hermes, and all of that. They might preach all kinds of stuff. But there was something that you have that they don't have. You've got fire. And we see all through scripture that fire is symbolic of the spirit. Are you hearing church? So Paul says, fan the flame. A lot of you are from this part of the world. We are come from in Benin City, in Nigeria. Back in the day, there was nothing like electricity stove or gas. We had firewood. Back in the day, we put all the wood together. And our grandmothers would go down on their knees. And sometimes we see them do... Other times, they will blow the, blow the fire. Why? Because the more the blood of fire, the more they agitate the fire. And the more the blood of fire, the more the fire begins, begins to ignite. Her. And when the Bible says, fan the flame, what Paul is saying to Timothy, ignite your fire. Take your fire to the next level. You're still burning yellow. That was the blue dimension. You're still burning orange. That was the blue dimension. There was a dimension of fire that is beyond your comprehension. But what you're about to enter, there was a kind of fire that needs your consistent blow. Somebody say consistent blow. Consistent blow. Fan the flame. Let it see in you. Many of you, you've lost out your fire anyway. For some, it is yellow. For some, it is white. For others, it is blue. The intensity of your flame is defined by your devotion. You cannot be asking God for a blue flame and speak to him once a week. <laughs> Can I ask God for a Lord, give me a consuming flame? Because the truth is this, let me help you. And be very careful how you ask for what you're not ready for. Because if you ask God for the blue flame, why you're not ready? What was meant to refine you will consume you. It is the same fire that refines that consume. They are Ability to withstand the fire is based on the material. You cannot be a wood asking for a blue flame. Are you hearing me, church? So be very careful for what you ask for because what you ask for has the propensity to consume you. Are you hearing me, church? So know who you are. And the Bible says the gift of God, which is through the laying on of hands. Now we understand that this gift of God is in the man. And I spent the time to look at the word uh, which is given to you by the laying on of my hands. Uh, I don't want to go, we, we believe in the, in the doctrine of the laying on of hands. It's scriptural. Um, it's a doctrine of impartation. And even though we don't find the word impartation, the, the laying on of hands, epithesis, from the word epistetis, which means um, epi upon and, uh, and, and, and thesis, thesis to, to on the side, uh, which means to to bring upon. So, so this is interesting. And that word bring upon, it means that there has to be a subject and an object. Therefore, whoever is imparting you has to work in the dimension of the impartation. What am I trying to say? I cannot give you what I don't have. So in order for me to impart fire in you, I must carry first fire. Are you here in church? And that's why you have to be very careful how people impart you. Because impartation is sharing an inheritance with you. Therefore, if Paul says to Timothy, I impart you by laying hands on you, it means that if you have blue fire, I have to have blue fire to give you blue fire. Are you here in church? So I cannot give you what you want if I don't have what you look for. So in order to impart you, I must first be an administrator of that dimension to give you revelation. You hear me? The Bible says that when Jesus walked on water and, and Peter said, if it is you, bid I to come. 
Jesus was walking on a dimension beyond man's comprehension. He defied the laws of gravity. Jesus became the custodian of that realm. Are you hearing church? You call that oikonomos. <laughs> he became the administrator. Oikonomos is the word oikia nomos. Oikia house. Nomos law. He became the administrator of that dimension. The law of the house. He understood the law of the house. And he was walking on water. And the Bible says when Peter saw him, they were scared. And Peter said, if it is truly you, be I to come. What Peter was saying to Jesus, if you are the Christ, invite me to your dimension. <laughs> And the Bible said, oh, Jesus says what echo my, yeah. And Jesus says to Peter, come. The Bible says Peter stepped on water. Why? The only reason why Peter stepped on water because when Jesus invited Peter, he gave him his dimensions. Hear me, church. So whoever functions in the realm, they have the ability to introduce you to that day. Are you hearing me, church? So I cannot impart you with what I don't have. Are you hearing, church? So Paul is saying there was something that was in you. Now we don't know what type of gift it is. But it's a charismatic gift. So we understand in scripture this is fire. If you look through scriptures, this means fire. There was the level of fire that this guy has. He has the fire and the fire that he has is not for him. Say to your your gift is not for you. I want you to be very, I don't want you to be casual. Say to your neighbor, your gift is not for you. Say, your gift is for the church. All right. Say to your neighbor, your gift is not for you. Your gift is for the church. We need your gift. When God brings people to a church, it's because God knows that they have an assignment in that assembly. So no one is designed to join a church and just sit down. When God sends you to a church, it's because they have a need. Are you here in church? Everyone here, there is something that you are born to give. And it is a waste of God's time and resource. If you come to church and sit down and the church has need of what you carry. It is a gift that was given at your salvific, salvific process. Now we understand that gift. I struggle to end there. Now this is a gift that is not for you. It's a gift for your brother and your sister. Remember Paul writes first Timothy, second Timothy to the church. Now let's see what Paul would write to the believer. Paul writes to the believers that were in Thessalonica. If you have your Bibles quickly, First Thessalonians 5 verse 9, just one verse, 5 verse 19. I'm probably going to do 20. <laughs> uh, uh. Paul was writing to believers. Are you hearing me, church? This is no longer Timothy, it's no longer, this is not pastoral. This is individual Christians. This is a gift that is not for the church. This is a gift that is for you. But I'll tell you what type of gift this is. It is not a pneumatological gift. This gift is called from the word you have kleronomos, kleronomia. Kleronomia is a sanctifying gift. This is a gift of sanctification. Are you hearing me, church? Uh, you know my problem with the church. Shall I tell you? Paul says, do not quench the spirit. There is a less cool error here, by the way, because you cannot quench the spirit. The spirit is indestructible. Once it's in your life, it's, you cannot quench him. The what? Spare my mind. The, the, the word quench there, it means to extinguish the power of. Other translation might say to stifle. To choke. Don't choke the spirit. It says quench not the spirit. So that word, spare, spare no mind, it, it means to, to quench. To get the fire out of. 
Are you hearing me, church? Then, if you look at the verse 20, it says, despise not prophecy. It's interesting how Paul writes about the gift given by prophecy. And now Paul writes again here, do not put out the spirit and don't despise prophecy. Paul was writing to Thessalonian, Thessalonian believers. And he says, do not put out the spirit. <sighs> the problem with the current church. We have many gift fans for spirit extinguishers. The dilemma of the current church are people who spend their time fanning the flame, the gift, but stifling sanctification. So I don't care how I live as long as I prophesy. Let me help you with the right word. The word despise, not prophecy. Really means don't abuse it. Because a lot of you have quenched the spirit but prophesying. <laughs> you hear what I say? Let me say it again. Poor eyes, do not stifle the spirit. Don't put the fire out. But that fire is not a fire for the church. It's a fire for your life. So Paul says that you, Thessalonians, that the problem with you is that you have stifled sanctification but finding your gift. Never ever judge your relationship with God based on the precision of your gift. Because you can be in sin and prophesy. Never judge, your rela- never judge the quality of relationship based on your tongues. Because you can speak in all types of tongues and still not be in God's way for your life. So when Paul says, do not quench your spirit, don't insult prophecy. Because it's very possible there are people who would know how to choke the spirit but prophesy. That word choke the spirit is something that fights your hagiazo or your cleidonomia, which fights your sanctification. What Paul is saying is that Paul writes to Timothy, stay up the gift that is in you because the church needs your gift. But after you've given the church your gift, after you have prophesied, cast out demons, after you've laid us on the sick, after you've walked in the spirit, how do you live your life? Do you have the fire in your bones still? Because you prophesy but live in sin. You cast out demons but don't live in sanctified. Paul said, I don't understand you people uh, that you find your gift so good uh, but you walk in the flesh I don't understand church uh, that you cast out demons uh, but you despise how can you prophesy and despise at the same time because we understand that prophesying is for the people but living the life of the spirit is for the believer so nowadays we don't care how we live as long as we are precise as long as we are we are accurate and that's the reason why church people we, we will say yes to anything that has Jesus beside it and, and that's the reason why we don't even walk by the spirit any longer we no longer discern anyone who prophesies is your papa is your mama and I see all social media people that are witches and warlocks uh, and they are controlling the masses and I see church people saying to them uh, oh you prophesy well uh, how do we judge prophecy how do we judge prophecy without taking their fruit it's in Interesting nowadays, uh, the church will run to a voodoo doctor who calls himself a reverend uh, because we care about the precision and not their character. And nowadays, the church is in so much mess. Why? Because we don't care how you live your life as long as you prophesy right. Uh, we don't care to check your fruit as long as you prophesy right. Uh, that's the reason why many churches uh, are held up by Tyre Tyra, that woman who calls herself a prophetess. Why? Because we don't judge our fruit anymore. We don't judge our fruit any longer. And what you do as long as you call my house address. Uh, as long as you tell me what I want to hear, I don't care to check your fruit as long as you prophesy well. So we have, we've had people who spend the time finding your gift every single day, finding their precision. I say it every time I say it online, I have never prayed for precision one day. I will never pray for God to give me precise. I will never pray. Because I realize that God gives precision when your eyes are focused on the bruised. Are you here in church? It is not my gift. It is his gift. And I believe that when God gives you his gift, he gives you his perfect will. The problem is that our lifestyle is blurring our precision. 
So we have a lot of people right now. All they do, Lord God, make me the voice of this nation. Is that what God wants? Make me the number one prophet. Is that what God wants for you? We are looking for the best prophet, but God is looking for the obedient ones. Those who will leave on their knees. Those who will stay on the altar. I'm not praying to God to give me the nation. I'm saying, God, give me your heart. Give me your will, Lord Jesus. We have too many people saying, give me the nation, sir. So give me the nation, sir. But no one walking in the things of the spirit. You can take the nations. Give me Jesus. Take the world. Give me Jesus. I'm not finding my gift. I want Jesus only. I'm done in a few minutes. So Paul writes and Paul says to Timothy, my son, the church needs your gift. I know you are discouraged, but find your gift not at the expense of the giver. Find your gift not at the expense of the source. And I look at the scripture and I look at the church nowadays. We have a lot of gifted people that haven't spent time with the Lord. It is a very dangerous place to hear from God precisely when you don't pray. If you are hearing God clear and you haven't prayed for a week, stop. Because God's not speaking to you. Just because something comes from an outer space doesn't make it divine. Be very careful what speaks to you. Because a lot of times you wonder. Because the man who is a prayer man is a man who lives in the intent of God. Do you understand there are dimensions in God? The highest level of a prophet is not the office. The highest level of a prophet is called friends. Are you Kevin church? Those who are his friends, it shows them his secret. There is a dimension in God called friendship. When God brings you to his realm, not to show you things but have conversation. I have been in spaces with God when God will say, son, come up. And I come up, it's not telling me things to tell the church, it's telling me things to know. The dimension called friendship. Those who, who are my friends, I show my secrets. Secrets are not shown to the church. Secrets are shown to his friends. But how can you be his friend with don't have, you don't spend time with him? So I, I looked at the, the church of Thessalonica. Amazing church. These are churches, they have a funny church. Because everything that Paul taught to them, it looks like Paul was joking. They were at least, uh, so much so, that when Paul left them in Thessalonica and went to Berea, and Paul says that the believers that were in Berea were more noble, more welcoming than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because those in Thessalonica, guess what they did? They didn't say scripture, they just accepted it. So Paul says those in Berea were more noble in that they received it and searched it. So the Christians that were in Thessalonica were not discerning. Anything that sounds good is God. Are you here in church? Huh? They don't have the time to go through the scripture and say, let me discern if God is speaking through. All the believers we are lukewarm. Why? Because the gauge of that of gauge of discernment was done. And everything that looks godly has to be God. And Paul said the believers in Berea were more noble. Why? Because they received it and searched it to make sure that all Paul had written is in the scriptures. So what Paul is saying now. Uh, there are believers that have lost their sense of discernment. As long as it has God in it, it is good. But God said to tell the church, be very careful when you find your flame. Don't find your flame at the expense of losing at your source. Are you here in church? Because what we've done over the years is that we've anointed and ordained many people. We've impacted you with the gift of prophecy. We haven't called that your sanctification. We give you all the gift, but when did we ask you, do you live right? Do you? You're asking... For this flame, does your life match the flame? So Paul would say to the church in Ephesus, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of the Lord, that you walk. Paripatio worthy, axios, or I could say katasio, but axios for today. Walk worthy according to the call which we should be called. Walk worthy. Let your walk match your fire. Walk worthy. You have uh, been activated, imparted with fire, but does your work match the fire? Because I, I realize that you, when we come to church on Sundays, you blast in other tongues and you speak in tongues, mystery, mystery tongues, and you, you are rolling on the floor and you are shouting and screaming and, and your hands are lifted to the heavens and, and we see the, the gift of God activated. We see you prophesy to people and we see you move in precise gifting. But after church on Monday to Saturday, I, I see how you live your life. You don't live like a believer, but on Sunday you're walking in the spirit. But on Monday to Saturday you're walking in the flesh and I'm wondering, I don't understand. On Sunday you speak 
and you lay hands and you walk in the dimension of the Holy Ghost. But on Monday to Saturday, and the Lord said to me, son, because these ones fan your flames once a week. From Monday to Saturday, all they do is live the life of the world. But on Sunday, because they're coming to church, they fan their flames before they come to church. So they wake up in the morning and then begin to fan their flames from morning to 3.30 p.m. Then they come to church. And I ask God why. God says, because, you me, church, we live in a world where your character is no longer put into check. As long as you can prophesy, be in the working force. But I understand back in Bible days that those they were called the presbyters in Bible times in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. The presbyters were not prophets. They were called the presbyters. And the presbyters were people who were part of the elders who have wisdom. So they may not prophesy, but they had wisdom. It's interesting to understand that character is the manifestation of the gift of the fruit of the spirit. But charisma is the manifestation of the gift of the spirit. We have a lot of people with great charisma, but no character. You speak in tongues, but yet you live in a sin world. I don't understand our people who come up on the microphone and blast in all types of tongues, but their character doesn't match the anointing. Yes, you prophesy, but do you say hello to your mama? Yes, you prophesy, but do you love your brother? Yes, you prophesy. Do you do the things of the spirit? Because God is tired of charisma without character. So, Paul writes to Timothy as I end. Paul writes, thank you. Paul says to Timothy, fan the flame. But I come with a different word today. And I ask you, check your flame. Because we, we're seeing scriptures of strange fires. Maybe what you're finding is not the flame of God. The Bible calls it the gift of God. Maybe it's the flame of self. Flame of deceit. And flames of I, me, myself, and I. Maybe what you're finding is not really the flame of God. Because I don't understand how you can find something that cannot convict you. I don't understand how much you find the flame and the flame doesn't tell you're living insane. I don't understand what flame you find and the flame doesn't burn at the things that is against the things of God. So my question, what kind of flame are we finding in this church? Is it a flame of anger? Is it a flame of tightness? Is it a flame of wickedness? Is it a flame of I'm not going to speak? What kind of flame are we firing? And as we prepare for flames to come, be very careful that when we get into flames and you stand before the presence of God, that the very thing you thought you'd been Fanning become the thing that destroys you. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me in this time that we are. God is not playing with the church like we thought he was playing before. When it comes to God, God is a serious God. So much so the Bible says that the gift that was given to you by prophecy, then in First Thessalonians, it says, young man, young woman, young church, do not quench the spirit. Don't stifle the spirit. Don't choke the spirit. So it is possible to find your flame and choke the spirit. We find the gift of prophecy. We find the gift of word of knowledge. We find the gift of word of wisdom. We find the gift of helps. We find the gift of tongues. We find the gift of interpretation of tongues. We find the gift of discerning of spirit. We find the gift of government. We find the gift they find in the scriptures. We've been finding the gift for a long time and we've spent time finding the gift. But the one who brings the gift is being choked. We've been choking the Holy Spirit and stifling him. And the Lord is sent to tell the church, walk in the spirit that you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. But we don't want to walk in the spirit. Why? How do I walk in the spirit? As long as I can prophesy in church, I don't need to walk in the spirit. As long as I call the name of Jesus, I don't need to walk in the spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says the day is going to come in 1 Corinthians 3 when God will bring our walks and God will bring our walks to himself and he will bring the hay, the stone, the hay, the wood, and then he will bring the sea by the precious stones. Uh, and the ones that the fire, listen, the fire that will consume me on the day is the one you refuse to refine me today. Are you hearing me, church? So we encourage the church to move in their gift. But we say to the church, not at the expense of his spirit. In the last day, knowledge shall abound and there were those that will come and say Jesus is not Lord and the best way they can prove to you is to do a miracle and those with itchy ears 
Let's be very careful. Even the Bible says, even the very elect under they. Pray that they're not deceived. Because what hell would do is bring and show you and tell you this is the real. Because we've spent so much time fanning the wrong thing. And if there is anything I want to say today right now, it's not to fan your flame because we've preached it many times. It's to let the spirit move. Take your hands off his throat. Stop stifling him. Stop choking. God is begging you, please leave me alone. So Paul writes, don't quench, don't silence. Don't choke hold this spirit. And guess what we are doing? Are you come? Guess what we are doing? My hands are clean, no worry. So what we are doing? Bring them out. In the name of Jesus, out, out. I see your father's name. We are moving in prophecy, but telling him to shut up. The one who gave us this gift, so we are we are moving in his gift, but told him to shut up. Don't talk, don't talk. And say in the name, so we are casting out demons in his name, but they've told him not to sh- not to talk. Uh, only go shut up. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, and when he tries to tell you stop it, in the name of Jesus, we cast you spirit. Uh, we've choked him, but spoken with his gifting. Because we know that the very moment we take our hands off his mouth, he will tell us we're not living right. So we've held up his mouth and fan. So we're fanning the flame, but holding on to the spirit. Because guess what? The gift that was given to tie to Timothy was for the church. But the one that was quenched is for him. Are you hearing? So my question to you today, would you please for just one day forget that you're a prophet? Could you for just one more minute forget the fact that God used you to prophesy? Because we become masters of fannings. We are professional gift fanners. We don't even no more good morning Holy Spirit anymore. When we wake up, the first thing we do is check our spirit gauge. Oh, I can still prophesy. Back in the day when you woke up in the morning, the first thing, thank you, Spirit of the living God. But nowadays, can I still prophesy? Can I say your names of people? We've mastered the art of our gifts. We know how to, I mean, if you wake me up, I can wake up anytime. I don't need to open my eyes. I can prophesy from my sleep. It's innate. It's in my DNA. I'm a prophet born. I don't have to think before I prophesy. It comes, it flows from my mouth. I'm a born one. I don't have to think to prophesy. As I wake up from the morning, big hands go. I'm seeing nations and I'm seeing people. It's innate, but that doesn't even that doesn't even define my relationship with the Lord because I can see, I can see, I can see, and have no relationship with Him. Church, maybe flames not about your gift today. Maybe this pre flames to call you back to the one who called you. Maybe this brief flames is to leave your gift aside and check your heart. Am I really stifling him? Because we don't want you to be so absorbed doing the things of the king that you miss the king. Don't let hell take you to hell. Don't let church take you to hell. Don't be absorbed doing the things of God that you miss God. Because the gift that was given to Timothy was for the church. He might come to church every single Sunday but have no relationship with him. The question today is not your gift that is for the church. The question is questioning your sanctification. Are you living right? And look at all the church age. It is a church of ladies here that God says you're not hot. You're not cold. You're lukewarm. Why? I really want to judge you so badly. But I can't judge you because on Sunday you're hot. But on Monday to Saturday you're so cold. I don't know how to... Jesus said to the church, choose cold or hot. Uh, he didn't tell the church to be hot. He says, make up your mind, choose hot or cold. I don't know where you are anymore. Because your gifting is on point. But your sanctification is zero. 
I, the one who prophesied and be cast away. After doing all these things, I stand before the Lord. And the Lord will say to me, Son, we said, Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not heal in your name? That is actually for the church. Did we not prophesy in your name? The gift is there. And we say, I do not know you. That word no is not Ginosko. That word no is the word Eido. That word Eido, Ginosko means general knowledge. Eido means intimate one. I don't have intimate relationship with you. Eido is from the past. That's, from, that's, that's the relationship that comes with, with coupling. I, I know the fire has coupled us as one. Not just I know you. But I don't have relationship with you. But I casted out demons in your name. It was for the church. I prophesied in your name. It was for the church. I moved the miracles in your name. It was for the church. But I'm judging you on the fire that is on you. Are you hearing me? After all that has been said and done, God will not hear me. After all said and done, God will not say, oh, you prophesied to the church so good. Come into my rest. What qualifies you as a servant is not your ability to do the things of the Spirit, but your availability to walk within kleronomia. That's where you get the word kleronomia from. And this wonderful evening, as we end right upon your feet, I have one question for you. One question. After you've done all, after you have prophesied, May I say that as a leader of the church, I want your gift to be given to the church. But if I'm being honest with you, I'd rather your sanctification than your charisma. If I'm being honest with you, I'd rather you're all sanctified than using your gift in the church. But what's the point prophesying and fighting? What's the point healing the sick and backbiting? What's the point? Walking miracles and they hate in your brother's hands. What's the point? I'd rather you don't stifle him and stifle your gift. I'd rather you come to church and go back home, say hello, don't know one, but live in sanctified than to live and walk and you do the things of the spirit but not live in sanctified. If you go for the gifts of the spirit, you miss God. But if you go for God, you have both the gifts and God. Are you hearing me, church? So this is that one day before flames that you're going to cast it on the altar. Lord, I have done everything, but I haven't known you. I am so gifted. I know how to prophesy. I know how to do the things of the Spirit. But I haven't given you my all. I haven't totally surrendered. This is the moment where your eyes are closed. You know what you are dealing with. Your gifting is not a problem. Gift of helps. Gift of administration. Gift of government. We, we know you're a prophet. We know you're apostolic. But I'm not calling out for that gift of the spirit. I'm calling out now for someone here. You feel like your fire is going down. Back in the day, I used to spend time in the things of God. I used to pray. I would fast. I will seek the face of God. But this season of my life, I have grown cold. If that is you, come out. I won't tell you to lift up your hands. I want you to come out. Come out. And I won't tell you to close your eyes. You know there is something more than my gifting. There is something more. Lord, take me back to the place where I would seek your face. Take me back to the place where I will hold on to you, not my gifting. Lord, I need a fresh start. A fresh start. We need a fresh start. Lord, again, a fresh start. Yes, now that you are here, cry to God and tell God, Lord, I am sorry. I 
don't need a fresh start cry to God you don't need to be ashamed God wants us to draw closer this is beyond your gifts this is beyond your charisma this is God calling you back yes you dream dreams yes you see visions yes you walk in the spirit but do you live sanctified I'm calling for your sanctification Lord again take me back to the cross open up your mouth and pray say Lord I'm sorry Lord I'm sorry Lord I'm sorry Lord a fresh start Lord I'm sorry cry to the Lord you got 60 seconds don't wait for me just cry Lord I'm sorry before flames Lord I need you more I need you more Lord I'm sorry Lord I know I'm gifted but I needed to work on my character Lord I'm gifted but walk on my character Lord I'm gifted but walk on me Jesus I don't want to stifle you I want to live sanctified Lord help me live sanctified Lord help me live sanctified I want to live a sanctified life Lord today open up your mouth church even before flames the Lord will purge your heart we purge your heart yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord cry to the Lord cry to the Lord a fresh start hallelujah cry to the Lord cry to the Lord cry to the Lord a fresh start a fresh start we cry we cry we cry we cry holy we cry we cry we cry we cry holy fresh start a fresh beginning oh god oh god a fresh beginning a fresh start we cry we cry we cry lord we we come before you today we acknowledge the fact that we are gifted Lord, we are sorry we've been fanning the flame and stifling your voice. We've been fanning the flame and muzzling your voice. Lord, we don't want to despise what we do. How can we despise prophecy? We don't want to mock our gifts, oh God. Oh Lord, today we cry to you, Jesus, that you search our hearts, oh God. Jesus. I want you guys to say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus. I want you to scream from your belly. Say, Lord Jesus. I come to you today that you might search my heart. Lord, I am sorry for stifling your voice. Lord, I'm sorry for muzzling your voice. I ask today for grace. For grace walk in the spirit Lord I'm sorry for all that I have done Lord I'm sorry for not prioritizing you even today Jesus search my heart and make me new again Lord I rededicate my life to you Lord I bring my struggles to you but look beyond my gifts and have mercy on me from this day this is a fresh start a new walk a new start help me Lord to walk according to the call I want to pray for you now Lord we are called a prophetic house but these ones haven't come out as prophets they haven't come out as apostles come out as servants sons and daughters who need and want more Lord they've come hungry for more of you not just the gifting Lord they've, they've been functioning in their gift but haven't spent the time to seek your face Lord we are not prophets today we are not apostles we are not pastors, teachers, evangelists Lord we come saying that there is more want you to take us back 
back to the foot of the cross the very moment we said yes to you the hunger that we had the very moment we said yes to you the love that we had Lord we want that love to rekindle again love for you and love for our brethren Lord we ask that you pour back your love in our hearts pour into our hearts oh God fresh love for church and for your kingdom Lord we pray that we don't want to leave this place having issues in our heart against our brothers and sisters Lord give us the grace to walk up to those that has hurt us give us the grace to forgive those who's hurt us give us the grace to let go the pain in our heart give us the grace to forget the hurt in our soul Lord give us the grace to let go these things that even fight our walk with you Lord we want to walk worthy according to the call Lord I pray for these ones today that they've made a decision a decision to follow you Lord open up your hands and receive them afresh not as gifted people but as hungry people not as prophets but as obedient ones I thank you God if you believe the Lord has hands that say thank you Jesus shout from your belly say thank you Jesus say thank you Jesus now give one, give your brother a hug. Give someone a hug and tell them a new start, a new walk, a new journey. Yes, Lord. Go back to your seat. When the music fades and all is stripped away. Let's sing the song as we get ready to give. Longing just for you Something that's a word Come on church That'll bless your heart I give you something more We say I'll bring you more than a song For a song For a song it is that It's not what It's not what you Let's do this song. You smash the keep living my soul. You search much deeper within through the way things are. The church is singing. Your love gets into my heart. Everyone in this house, uh, we coming. Yes, we say. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. All of us. by your left and by your right stretch your hands today we are not here as gifted people we are here as repentant people I am not a prophet or an apostle on this altar I'm a man seeking mercy and I say God I live by assignment aside I just want to walk according to your spirit when the music fades when the music fades hold them left and right all is stripped away and I simply go let a song minister to you as you hold your brother we say we just today that we give you something son yes the brook place for a song it's not what you have TBP you're speaking to the Lord we say you search much deeper
the church. Let us cry as TVP. We say, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about Jesus. All about not our gifts, not our money, all not our anointing. We're coming back to the cross. I'm sorry, Lord, for It's all about you. It's all about you. 